If we're being honest, every homilist fears preaching on Trinity Sunday. We're expected to explain the Trinity in language that is meaningful to the congregation without accidentally stepping on any of the literally dozens of Trinitarian heresies that exist. And we're expected to do this in less than 10 minutes. So I ask you to excuse me as I gracefully sidestep that problem and instead choose to speak about how we can apply the ideas of the Trinity to our lives. I mean, if I can't help you understand how you can make use of the Trinity in your life, what's the point, right? With that in mind, I'd like to tell you a little anecdote from when my wife and I got married. At that time, unity candles were all the rage as part of wedding ceremonies. In fact, I don't know, they may still be. Anybody recently married, are they still doing unity candles? I see a lot of blank stares, so I guess not. Um, for those who don't know, a unity candle is a symbolic part that would be used in some wedding ceremonies where the bride and groom would each take a small candle and together light a larger big one. And the symbolism was that this couple was now united in will and spirit. They were one. But there was a big controversy around unity candles. And the controversy was, should the two individual candles be extinguished, or should they remain lit? Now, from what I understand, originally the idea was they were extinguished. You were now one, one candle, you don't need the two little ones. But some argued that even in marriage, we have our own individual interests and desires, and so the individual spirits should still stay lit even once we've lit the united single one. Others would then counter, no, this, you know, the symbolism here is they are united and to leave the other two lit didn't make any sense. And so this was one of those liturgical wars of the late 90s, and it raged on both sides with everybody calling each other idiots and all that kind of stuff. My mind was brought back to this trivial little squabble of that era when I was agonizing over how to explain the Trinity today. Because one aspect of the Trinity is that despite them being three separate persons, they are, and, and a person, if you understand what it means to be a person, a person requires a will. When you are a person, that means you have your own will. And so when we say that the Trinity has three persons, we are saying that there are three wills. But yet at the same time, we are saying that these three persons are so united in will that they are but of one will and purpose. And so I think, and I do not remember what we did at our wedding, um, I think they, the candles should have been extinguished. I think the point of marriage is in part to emulate this love that God has within the Trinity. And while it might be true that there is some reality of individualness in our wills, the goal of marriage, the reason it is a sacrament, is so that we will emulate this love of God, the love of the Trinity, where you have two wills that are separate because they are persons, but they are so united that they are one will. And so if you're looking for something today to say, how can I apply the Trinity to my life? If you are married or you someday desire to be married, this is the love you are trying to emulate with your spouse. You are trying to reach a place where your wills are so united that they are effectively one. 
And so I think we should spend some time this week reflecting within our marriages about this. Sure, it's always going to be imperfect. All of us fall short of these types of goals. But if we spent some time this week sitting down with our spouse, or if we're not yet married, thinking about how we would interact with our future spouse, and talk about where is our will not fully united? We should ask ourselves questions like, am I so united to my spouse that what they want is what I want? Are Is their will my will? I think we can get a lot closer to this ideal than we give ourselves credit for. True love empties us of ourself in a way that allows us to unite our will to another. And we can get to that place where if your wife loves Spanish, but natively you don't, you can still love Spanish. <clears throat> My wife's a Spanish teacher, for what it's worth. And I failed high school in Spanish, so this is very relevant and personal. We can be united in will, even in a place that seems inherently not. I can suggest that our next vacation be to Mexico, to be united with my wife in her will. And she can do the same for me in my areas. In fact, next weekend we're going on a river rafting trip. I know that if it was just her will, we would not be going on a river rafting trip. (laughs) So let's spend some time on this idea this week. Let's focus on how we can better unite our will to our spouse. Let's have a conversation and enter into it with humility, knowing that this is challenging and difficult. Let's focus not so much on ourselves, but on our spouse and our family. And finally, let's remember that the highest call of marriage is not inwardly focused on the two of you, but outwardly focused on being of service to the world. And let's find a way to be united with our spouse in being a force for good, a force for God's love in our world that so desperately needs the love of God.